Just before we get started, did you know that I have a podcast, it's called The Brain Food Show. It covers topics similar to what we do here at Today I Found Out, but in a longer form. It's more podcasty. I co-host the show with Dave and it runs for about an hour, so it's a bit more of a commitment than you're used to here, but if you like podcasts, maybe you'll love it. Get it all good podcast platforms by just searching Brain Food One Word or follow one of the links below and let's get into it. And today we are answering a viewer question because Blaine Berger asks us, what function does natural aspirin serve in the tree that makes it? Salicylic acid is found in varying degrees in a wide range of plants, including potatoes, tobacco, unripe fruits, including blackberries and blueberries, cantaloupe, kiwi, green pepper, tomato and olives, mushrooms, and of course, willow. Of course, who didn't know? <laughs> Definitely not me. <laughs> so, what purpose does it serve in these plants? To begin with, a phenolic. Oh, we're getting science -y. Phenolic. Oh, God. Phenolic. 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 Oh, come on. Phenolic. To begin with, a phenonic compound together with cytokinins, auxins, gibberellins, ethylene, and abscisic acids. <laughs> Surely gibberellins is not a real thing. It even sounds like gibberish. Oh, anyway, they all play a role in plant growth and development. And I know I'm not pronouncing them right. It would be impossible. I'd look them all up and then I'd not remember it when I read them all. Anyway. Uh, it's also important in photosynthesis and nitrogen metabolism, albeit these processes are not really well understood. Anyway, this compound, it helps plants deal with environmental stresses such as extreme or sudden cold, drought, salinity, poor diet, heat, and even heavy metals. This is done, at least in plants, by the salicylic acid inducing different gene expressions within the plant. For example, in times of high temperatures, salicylic acid in some plants will induce gene expressions necessary to encode chaperone, a heat shock protein. Really? Chaperone is a heat shock protein, as well as someone who will accompany young people to dances, according to American movies at least. Salicylic acid is also key to some plants' resistance to pathogens. When attacked by a microbe, the salicylic acid levels in these plants' infected areas increase and help mediate the accumulation of pathogenesis-related proteins that help the plant fight the invader. Effective therapy for people as well as plants, humans have harvested salicylic acid from willow bark since ancient times when the Babylonians, Chinese, and Assyrians all used it for medicinal purposes. In fact, the father of medicine, Hippocrates, from 460 to 375 BC, or BCE. The amount of heat we get on that is absurd. Even prescribed it for pain and to relieve fever. Salicylic acid was first isolated by Edward Stone in 1763. Nearly 100 years later, Charles Frederick Gerhardt was the first to turn it into aspirin, aka acetyl. A still, still. Oh my God. A stylati, ty, sala. Acetyl. Acetyl salicinic. Nearly 100 years later, Charles Frederick Gerhardt was the first to turn aspirin, aka acetyl salicylic acid, when he mixed sodium salicylate, a salt of salicylic acid, and acetyl chloride. Biochemists produced their own synthesized version of it in 1897. Designed to be less upsetting to the stomach than salicylic acid, it was derived from spirea and ulmeria and called salicin. The designer acetyl salicylic acid was named aspirin by Bayer after the plant's name, as well as Spirsore, an old German word for salicylic aspirin. Uh, an interesting note is that around the same time Bayer was working on aspirin, they were also working on heroin. <laughs> A much more potent painkiller. In fact, when the head of the pharmacological laboratory at Bayer, Heinrich Dresser, had aspirin pitched to him as something the company should push, Dresser famously rejected it, stating to quote, the product has no value. In contrast, he felt heroin was amazing. <laughs> 
On this one, while opium itself had been commonly used since at least 3400 BC, heroin is a relatively new invention derived from opium. Heroin, more technically known as diacetylmorphine, was first synthesized in 1874 by chemist Charles Romley Alder Wright, working at St. Mary's Hospital Medical School in London, England. He discovered the drug after playing around with mixing morphine with various acids, in this case after boiling acetic anhydride with anhydrous morphine alkaloid for a few hours which resulted in what we now commonly call heroin. After running a few experiments with it on animals, though, he abandoned his work on the drug. 23 years later, a man by the name of Felix Hoffmann, working at Bayer in Germany, managed to independently synthesize heroin when he was trying to produce codeine. The new derivative of opium was found to be significantly more potent than morphine, and the aforementioned Heinrich Dresser decided that they should move forward with it as a product the company sold. It should be noted that Dresser was apparently well aware of Wright having synthesized heroin 23 years before, but despite this, he claimed heroin was an original Bayer product, and by early 1898, they began the animal testing phase of the product, testing it primarily on rabbits and frogs. They next moved on to testing it on people, primarily workers at Bayer, including Heinrich Dresser himself. <laughs> it was like, this is awesome! <laughs> After successful trials, heroin was presented to the Congress of German Naturalists and Physicians as more or less a miracle drug that was, to quote, 10 times more effective than codeine as a cough medicine and worked even better than morphine as a painkiller. He also... <laughs> imagine taking, like, going to the pharmacy, it's like, yeah, I need some cough medicine, here's some heroin! <laughs> He also stated that it had almost no toxic effects, including being completely non-addictive. <laughs> well, that turned out to be false. Dresser particularly pushed heroin as the drug of choice for treating asthma, bronchitis, tuberculosis, and tysis. <laughs> Be like, yeah, you know, before asthma and heroin, we had heroin. <laughs> On top of that, one of the common early uses of heroin was as a non-addictive medicine to help treat people who were addicted to morphine, even though heroin ultimately proved to be even more addictive. Surprise! <laughs> Funny enough, when morphine was first isolated from opium in 1805, one of its early uses was as a non-addictive drug to treat people who were addicted to opium. In any event, if it seems odd to you that Dresser should push heroin as a cough medicine over its painkilling effects, it should be noted that at the time Time, tuberculosis and pneumonia were among the world's leading causes of death, and one of the leading methods to treat this was using codeine, which is fairly addictive given regular use. Because heroin worked well as a sedative and a respiration depressor, it did indeed work extremely well as a type of cough medicine and allowed people affected by debilitating coughs to finally be able to get some proper rest free from coughing fits. Further, because as noted it was marked as non-addictive unlike morphine or codeine, it was initially seen as as a major medical breakthrough. Just one year after its release, heroin became a worldwide hit, despite it not actually being marketed directly to the public, but rather simply to physicians. Heroin was soon sold in a variety of forms, mixed into cough syrup, made into tablets, mixed in glycerin solution as an elixir, and put into water-soluble heroin salts, among others. At the end of this first year, it was popularly sold in over 23 countries, with Bayer producing around one ton of it in that year. Obviously, it quickly became apparent that Bayer's claims that the drug was not addictive were false, with reports popping up within months of its widespread release. Despite this, it continued to sell well in the medical field, as lots of drugs are addictive. Many physicians just cared that it worked and treated certain serious ailments. However, by 1913, the number of heroin addicts began to skyrocket, ultimately resulting in Bayer deciding to stop producing the drug. Probably a good decision. Once heroin's star began to fall, as people began to realize how addictive it was, Dresser revisited his decision on aspirin, which quickly became Bayer's best-selling product. Aspirin was a huge hit, and sales spiked even more thanks to the Spanish flu pandemic, which killed between 50 and 100 million people and infected around half a billion of the globe, which was roughly one in four humans at the time, and it possibly killed as many as one in 20 people. Funnily enough, aspirin is generally thought to have made the death rates during this particular pandemic even worse than they would have been without it. For example, a sudden spike in death rates among young people in October 1918 was preceded by a recommendation to take a large amount of aspirin, specifically one gram, that's 15 grains, every three hours until symptomatic relief is secured. Noteworthy here is that salicylate accumulates 
in the body, and toxic results include vomiting, hyperventilation, and pulmonary edema. In the 1918 pandemic, many deaths occurred early in the infection, and a great number of these were from wet or hemorrhagic lungs. During an autopsy on one of the victims, the examiner noted that the amount of the lung that was pneumonic seemed to be too small to account for the death, although the lungs, which appeared as if they had been drowned, were filled with a thin, watery, bloody liquid. About 50% of these early deaths suffered from cerebral edema as well. Since pulmonary and cerebral edema are often found today in autopsies of people who've died from aspirin toxicity, some researchers have theorized that many of the deaths from the 1918 influenza outbreak were simply from overprescribing aspirin. And now for some bonus facts. After Heinrich Dresser left Bayer, he once again picked heroin over aspirin, this time to his doom, when he eventually died of a stroke. You see, it appears in his waning years he began taking heroin daily rather than aspirin to treat his health problems. What is... <laughs> you imagine, no, 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 it's for health. It's definitely for health. 100% <laughs> for health. <laughs> What is ironical about this, of course, is that a daily dose of aspirin may have prevented his stroke. And now for another bonus fact. The originally trademarked name of heroin thought to derive from the German word heroish, heroic, due to the way the workers who tested heroin on themselves reported that it made them feel, Bayer ultimately lost the trademark for heroin in a few key markets at the same time they were forced to give up their trademark on aspirin thanks to World War I. During World War I, Bayer's assets, including their trademark rights in the US and the Triple Entente allies, UK, France, and Russia, were confiscated and it became common to simply refer to all brands of the drug as aspirin in those countries, among others. Finally, after the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, Bayer officially lost their trademarks on heroin and aspirin in the US, France, Russia, and the UK. And speaking of world wars not being very good for Bayer, they had their legacy significantly tarnished during World War II when they became part of the Farben German chemical company conglomerate that is known to have used slave labor during World War II, including managing slave labor camps. Further, Farben was the group that manufactured Cyclone B, the cyanide-based pesticide used in the Nazi gas chambers. Bayer was forced to separate from Farben after World War II. So, on that note, not going to ask whether you enjoyed this video, but I do hope you found it interesting. If you did, smash that thumbs up button below. Do not forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching.